speaker from all the way from America, that is Dale Strickler, was once uh, very skeptical of the value of conservation agriculture. So who, who of us has got skepti skeptical hands up? Oh, you know, oh, We all, at some stage, was skeptical. Some of us are still skeptical in this room. Most of the people out there are still skeptical. So we have to change the situation. But Dale is here and he's, he's here to tell us all about his journey and his experiences and um, we are very glad you are here Dale. And But nowadays he not only applies conservation agriculture to his farm in the American constituent state of Kansas, but also ultra high density grazing. In his role as National Technical Manager for Green Cover Seed, a leading cover crop company in the US, he works closely with farmers to establish regenerative farming on, on farms. His book, I'm sure you can read that book, he can tell you all about the book, The Drought Resilient Farm, is a summary of the lessons he has learned on how regenerative agriculture can improve farmers' resilience remarkably. It fits perfectly in our story, in our journey, and we really look forward to your message. Dale, you're most welcome. Thank you for your willingness and attitude to talk to us. Thank you very much. Good I am. Uh, I'm going to begin with a story. Um, when I was 14 years old, my father had a feedlot. We would take our our steers after weaning. We would put them into a feedlot. When I was 14, we had a number of wild pigs just show up in the feedlot. No one raised pigs for 30 kilometers around us. We have no idea where they came from. And they ate nothing. We fed them nothing. All they had to eat was manure from the steers. But they got fat. And they got very fat. And so we butchered them. And my father, we, we sold me and he wasn't about to sell someone meat from a pig that had eaten nothing but manure because you are what you eat and it wasn't good enough to sell. But it was good enough for him to feed his family. <laughs> and it was the most delicious pork we've ever had. It was wonderful, amazing, and juicy and flavorful and, and I still remember with sadness the day my mother brought out the last plate three years later of the manure eating pigs. And it was a very sad day. It was almost like a death in the family. I tell you that story to set up another story. Okay, first of all, this is where I live, the exact center of the United States live in a little town. Um, uh, my address is in Belleville. My farm is in a nearby town in Portland. Uh, as far from the coast as you can get. In fact, as far from anywhere as you can get in the United States. But um, obviously, I am a long ways from home. I've never farmed here. I don't know how to farm in South Africa. But I'm going to see what we do have in common. Does it take sunlight to grow your crops? Mine too. Does rain make your crops grow better? Mine too. Are your soils composed of sand, silt, clay, organic matter, and have pore spaces that contain air and water? Mine too. Uh, do your crops respond to nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur? Mine too. And do they use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis? Mine too. We're just alike. Ah, but we have a different climate. So what I have here 
is the rainfall of Johannesburg and I can see that you get rain mostly in your summer. The green bars are the rainfall. The purple line is your monthly average temperature. So look at this table and here's mine. The brown line is our average monthly temperature and the blue bars are our rainfall. We get most of our rainfall in the summer and we are hot in the summer and we are cold in the winter. Um, sound familiar? Okay. Difference is we are wetter and colder than you are in the winter. And our rainfall occurs earlier in the summer. Most of our rainfall occurs in early summer. Most of yours, if you are like where else I've been this week, has been more late summer rainfall. So all of that is to set you up for this. This is what the pigs were eating in the feedlot. Like I said, I'm a long ways from home. I've never farmed in South Africa. I can't tell you how to farm in South Africa. Please don't say, that man from America said to do this, and so I'm going to do this. I'm just going to simply tell you things that I've seen work elsewhere. It's up to you to decide what will and will not work in your situation. Those pigs in the feedlot got fat because they were able to take this pile of manure and pick out the kernels that would make them fat. So as you listen to me, don't swallow the entire pile of manure. Pick out the kernels that will be used to get. Okay, so, um, is it possible to drought proof your soil? Um, this is a picture from the Dust Bowl in the United States that occurred in the 1930s. My grandfather went through this. He told stories of the dust blowing and how they would have to plug the windows to keep the dust from coming in. So it was quite a thing. Historically, we thought the only thing we could do about drought was to pray. Is that our only solution? I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. But there's a joke about a man in a, truck, in a flood. And he's praying to God that God will rescue him from this flood. And as soon as he opens his eyes from the prayer, there's a rowboat. And the guy says, jump in the rowboat. He said, no, God will rescue me. I have faith. And then a little while later, the water is coming up. He's standing on top of his roof. And, and a motorboat comes by and said, jump in. He said, no, I have faith. God will rescue me. And then the water rises and it's up to his neck as he's standing on top of the building. And a helicopter comes and drops a ladder. He said, climb in. He said, no, God will rescue me. I have faith. And then he drowns. And he goes to heaven and he meets God. And he says, God, I prayed to you. I had faith. Why didn't you rescue me? He said, you idiot, I sent two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> Sometimes, God shines favor on those who help themselves. So let's look at how we can take care of drought and better take care of God's creation. This is one of my neighbors. Obviously, this crop is suffering from drought. Very severe drought. Just didn't rain. God's will. This is the field next to him. Did the drought stop at the fence line? Obviously, there's a difference in management here. So what's the difference? I'll tell you later. How do you improve the drought tolerance of soil? First thing, we'll talk about all these factors. You increase the infiltration of rainfall into the soil. You reduce evaporation 
of the water that's in the soil. You improve the soil water holding capacity. You increase the depth of your roots, increase your root efficiency. In other words, very simply, you get it in, you keep it in, and then you get it out. So, the first step is to increase infiltration. Maybe we can't affect the rainfall, but we can affect how much of the rainfall actually enters into our soil. If it enters into the soil, that's good. If it runs off the soil, obviously that's bad. Not only because we lose that moisture, but when it leaves the field, there are bad things that can happen. One is that it carries soil with it. Another thing is that it carries fertilizer with it. Not only is that fertilizer that we paid for, but when it gets into water, it causes problems. I live in the Corn Belt of the United States where uh, all of our rainfall or all of our water drains into the Gulf of Mexico at New Orleans. At one time, there was a, a very thriving shrimp and oyster industry. Now it's no more. There is a huge hypoxic zone where the ocean is dead, where all of my fertilizer ran off and went in to the Mississippi River. We have uh, our Natural Resources Conservation Service, our Soil Conservation Service, has what is called a rainfall simulator. It's this machine, as you can see, pans of soil are taken as they are, as they lie in the soil. They're placed in this pan on an incline and a funnel at the bottom. The jars you see at the bottom collect the runoff from each of these treatments. Okay, in this one, as you can see, the center one is tilled soil with no residue cover. The one on the far right is cover crop and no-till. What do you notice about the runoff in those two jars? Not only do you see that the amount of runoff is vastly different, but look at the soil in the middle one and the absence of soil in the one on the far right. The most amazing thing about this demonstration though is at the end of the demonstration, they'll take the pan from the tilled soil, turn it upside down, so you can see how far this 50 millimeter rainfall went into the soil. These pans are 50 millimeters thick. The pan on the left is the cover crop no-till, went completely to the bottom. The one on the right is tilled soil. 50 millimeter rain, didn't penetrate 50 millimeters into the soil. When I was growing up, it was a common saying in my area that we are always one week away from a drought and one hour away from a flood. Why were we like that? I was told, well, that's just the way our soil is. No, that's not the way our soil is. That's the way our soil has been managed. That's the way we made our soil, with tillage. I was taught, when I asked my father why I had to go out and till the soil, he said, it's because if you don't, I will kick your butt. My grandpa is more diplomatic. He would say, we till the soil because if we, to loosen it so that water enters more easily. That's actually not the way it works, as you can see. And this is a trial where they did moldboard plowing on the same field side by side with no-till. The infiltration moldboard plowed field, 50 millimeters per hour. On the no-till side, 163 millimeters per hour. Water goes into no-till soil faster. Now, we're back up here. This particular field, you see the absence of weeds? Are you interested in what herbicide this farmer used to get that level of weed control? He used none. No-till organic. No tillage, no herbicide. 